Hello, and thank you for joining the 2020 Young Scholars Program webinar. I am Alan Royal. I'm the Senior Program Manager of Outreach and Partnerships at the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. And we are very excited about this year's application process and are hosting this webinar, a recorded version of this webinar to assist students and families that are seeking to complete the application this year. So we hope to cover the Young Scholars Program and the program experience, as well as talk a little bit about the application process and provide some extra guidance and tips on how to complete and submit a quality application um, for the Cook Young Scholars Program. So I'll go ahead and get started. First, I will outline a little bit of what I'm going to cover today. Um, and we're going to start essentially with talking a little bit about who are Cook Young Scholars, um, what type of students are we seeking to find when we engage this application process. Um, and then I'll move into talking about the Young Scholars Program experience about how the scholarship itself works and what the program expectations are. And then we'll discuss the eligibility for applying for the program and what the criteria that we're looking for are when we're evaluating applications. Then I'll move into discussing how to access the application and take you through a little bit of what the application looks like. And then I'll end with a little bit about the timeline for submitting the application and moving through our process, our review process, as well as how we seek to support applicants to have questions and make sure that they stay informed throughout the time that we are evaluating applications about their status um, and when they can expect to be notified about final decisions. So when we think about um, Cook Young Scholars, um, they are a dynamic group of students that come from a wide array of backgrounds. They are academically talented students who are serious about their educational goals and about making an impact in their communities. Um, and so Cook Scholars really aspire to, uh, number one, attend college and attend best fit colleges, um, as well as attain personally meaningful career pathways um, throughout their journey through their education. So we have a 98% enrollment rate in a four-year college or university for our Cook Young Scholars. So the program itself is designed as a college preparatory program and majority, vast majority of students do move on to attend college. And these students are attending all types of schools and reside all over the country. Um, so they may be at a local public school, they may be at a private school or a boarding school, they may be engaging an IB curriculum or an AP curriculum or an honors curriculum. And so we see many of them are taking AP tests or engaging in IB projects and doing well um, with those. And so um, that's very important. And they also pursue um, a challenging curriculum as well. And so um, they're taking advantage of the opportunity to challenge themselves in class and out of class. They pursue and are involved in extracurricular activities on and off their campuses. Um, and so we see uh, a good majority of them are also involved in their community and attempting to impact and serve their community in a variety of ways as well. Um, there are no rules regarding where they attend school or what type of activities they have to be involved in, um, but we are looking for students that are critically engaged with their community and their environment in addition to being um, very focused on academic achievement and doing well in school. The Young Scholars Program experience um, has three main components that um, young scholars will engage with. The first and probably most important is the personalized advising that they receive. So young scholars work with an educational advisor that is on staff at the Jack Kent Cook Foundation. 
And this person is their guide to navigating the program. It's their main point of contact with the foundation. And they communicate with their scholars, advisors communicate with their scholars about every four to six weeks via phone or video chat. And they talk about important educational decisions and different things that are going on with them in pursuit of their education and completing their school projects as well as supplemental or enrichment activities um, to help sort of progress them along the path to accomplishing their goals. Um, they engage in annual goal setting with their advisor um, and they receive college counseling to help navigate that college application process when they become juniors in high school. And so the advising is sort of the, the critical sort of cog in the wheel that helps them move towards their eventual goals with college. The second component of the program obviously is the financial support that scholars receive. And um, they do receive scholarship money. Um, each young scholar is awarded an annual scholarship each year during their time in high school to pursue educational enrichment opportunities. And this funding is determined by creating what we call an individualized learning plan or ILP for short. And each ILP maps out how the scholarship dollars will be spent on that student for the academic year. And I'll talk in more detail about the types of financial support provided in a few minutes. The third component of the program is the scholar community and scholars benefit greatly from participating in this community and getting to know each other. They expand their network of peers and mentors. And so the, the Cook Scholar community is very active and engaged. We have a robust alumni network that contributes to the community and connects with scholars to help guide them toward their goals. And again, the educational advisors really help facilitate this community um, by hosting online hangouts. And these are typically multiple scholars that will come together um, to discuss uh, a particular topic that the advisor has prepared for them. And they have really awesome conversations and learn from each other and benefit from each other in this online environment. Um, they also have group meetups um, in their hometowns or in their local communities. And so many times advisors will visit scholars in person um, or the foundation will host events that help bring scholars together in this community and give them that opportunity to continue to get to know each other and network with each other. So the scholar community is also a very critical part of the program experience. And we expect scholars to be able to take advantage of all three of these components in order to maximize their time in the program. A little more about the role of the educational advisor. Um, again, this person is seeking to build a strong relationship um, with the scholar and their family um, and guide them on some of their educational decisions. Um, they also visit the scholar um, when they begin the program. And again, they're the, the main person overseeing all of the students' scholarship expenses and the, the individualized learning plan. So they're working on a four-year plan throughout high school. They're creating these ILPs. They're facilitating these conversations with other scholars. Um, and so they're really sort of the centerpiece in allowing the scholars to take full advantage of the resources and the opportunities that the foundation can provide through the scholarship. As I mentioned previously, that support, that financial support through the scholarship um, happens in a variety of ways. These are a few examples of the types of educational items that the scholarship could potentially pay for. The scholar ILPs are typically very individualized and they're designed to address the specific needs of that student. So no two ILPs look exactly the same or spend the exact same dollar amount. Um, but these are some of the, the more common examples of the types of enrichment that the program has supported in years past. Um, so things like summer programs, online courses, um, access to technology that they will need to be more successful in the classroom, 
attending conferences, accessing internships. All of these are examples of things that could go into the into the ILP. And the ILP is, again, it's a conversation that scholars have with their educational advisor in order to create what's going to best serve them on their educational journey. A little bit more about how the community comes together, the Young Scholar community. One of the ways that we do this, one of the biggest ways that the foundation and the Young Scholars Program advisors and team do this is through Cook-sponsored summer programs. Um, and so initially when scholars are accepted as a Young Scholar, they will um, have the opportunity to attend an event called Welcome Weekend after the summer of their eighth grade year. And this is a four day weekend, a residential experience where each young scholar and one parent or guardian are invited to the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. And they spend time getting to know the Young Scholars Program staff and sort of experiencing an orientation to the program. So they have the opportunity to learn about what they will be doing over the course of the next four years. And immediately following Welcome Weekend, the parents will go home and the scholars will stay um, on the campus of UPenn and attend their first residential summer experience in the program as a cohort. So as an entire group of new young scholars, they will attend that summer program together and begin to learn um, leadership skills. They'll work on a project together that they will present as a group, as a small group. They're broken into different groups based on interests and they present about this project at the end of the program. So it's sort of like their initiation into this residential summer experience if they have not had the opportunity to experience something like that before, um, as well as it helps build that cohort camaraderie and allow them to get to know each other and again, understand what that summer program experience should be like so they can continue to take advantage of it throughout the rest of their time in high school. And they attend summer programs in all of their years, so in high school, so in 10th and 11th grade, they also have the opportunity to choose from among about five partner programs that the foundation is partnered with based on their academic interests, or they can work with their advisor to find a better suited program for their educational goals if one of the five partner programs doesn't quite align with what they're trying to do. Um, so again, just another example of how working with the educational advisor is really critical and allow scholars to sort of formulate what they feel like would be the best way to um, learn more about their interests and pursue their passions um, academically. That happens during 10th and 11th grade. The summer before their senior year, they come back together as a cohort to experience another cohort-wide summer program that's called Senior Summit. And in this program, um, scholars will research alongside university faculty and graduate students across a variety of fields to uh, get a more hands-on experience related to their interests. And then they also begin planning for the college application process in the fall as well. And so they have the opportunity to collaborate with their advisor who visits them during their time at Senior Summit and begin to, to make plans for those next steps moving into the college application process. Another aspect of the program um, that's very important to be aware of is the continuing support that exists for young scholars after they've graduated. Um, we do have a college scholarship with the Jack Kent Cook Foundation and um, young scholars are eligible to apply um, typically for that college scholarship. Um, they apply for it along with other seniors across the nation who are also applying for the, the Cook Foundation College Scholarship. However, they do not compete um, for their scholarships um, with those other students. Um, the expectation is that the young scholars will have the opportunity to receive that college scholarship if they've engaged with the program throughout their time in high school and they submit a strong, complete application. And that scholarship does award up to $40,000 per year for four years. So it's a, it's a very generous scholarship. And our goal really is that young scholars would receive it and be able to take advantage of it and hopefully graduate from college debt-free. 
Um, but again, they do have to apply for that. It's not an automatic award by becoming a young scholar, um, but we fully expect them to be able to take advantage of that when they become seniors in high school. Okay, how do you know if your student is a good fit to apply to this program? Well, you we wanna start with the eligibility requirements and um, make sure that your student meets these requirements. They need to meet all of these requirements in order to submit an application. So they should currently be in the seventh grade and entering eighth grade in the fall of 2020. In terms of their academic achievement, we expect them to have made A's and B's only since the beginning of sixth grade. So we'll ask them to submit report cards from sixth grade and that first semester of the seventh grade to uh, see what their grades have been like. Uh, they also need to be residing in the United States or U.S. territory and plan to attend college in the United States or plan to attend high school, I'm sorry, high school in the United States. And finally, they need to demonstrate unmet financial need. What we mean by this is families that are eligible to apply for Cook scholarships need to earn up to $95,000 per year or have $95,000 adjusted gross income on their tax returns in order to be eligible. This is sort of our cutoff for um, demonstrating unmet financial need. So if your student meets all of these eligibility requirements and you feel like they would be able to take advantage and be excited to take advantage of the, the experience that I've described previously, then they definitely should consider applying. So once they've submitted an application and we begin the review process, this is the set of selection criteria that we are evaluating when reviewing the applications. Um, first and foremost being academic achievement. It is a, an academic scholarship, a, a merit scholarship, as well as a need-based scholarship, but it is defined by their achievement first and foremost. So we expect them to have a strong academic record, that we evaluate from not only their report cards, we'll also ask for standardized test scores, and we will ask them to submit uh, recommendation letters from their teachers. So we'll, we'll pay attention to those factors as well as their love of learning and their intellectual curiosity, and we'll determine these factors based on their responses to the short answer and essay questions that they complete in their application. Additionally, uh, we're also looking at a few other factors. We want young scholars to be well-rounded individuals, well-rounded students and people. So we look at things like persistence. What we mean by persistence is demonstrating that determination and that perseverance in the face of challenges um, and demonstrating an ability to set and remain focused on goals. Um, so it's not a, an adversity measure in the sense that we are looking for students that have encountered the most adversity. We recognize that many students have um, dealt with all types of obstacles and challenges, and we are interested in how they respond when met with an obstacle or a challenge, but we're not interested in measuring those challenges and those obstacles against one another in order to decide who we will select. Um, in addition to persistence, leadership is also a critical element that we're looking to find. What we mean by leadership is a demonstrated ability to positively influence others in and out of school. So these students will identify, you know, problems or issues and really like to seek to take initiative to work towards solutions to problems. Um, so leadership can be defined in a variety of ways. It doesn't necessarily just mean that they are holding an office in a student organization or um, you know the president or the head of, of some sort of community organization it could mean that it could be that they're demonstrating leadership in their church it could be that they demonstrate leadership in their home and in their family dynamic so the applicants will have the opportunity to explain how they are a leader um, in their own communities to us in the application and then finally service to others what we mean by this is we're seeking to uh, select students that have um, created opportunities for meaningful service to others um, by you know, seeing a need and fulfilling it voluntarily. It's not something that they're required or expected to do, but it's a, a part of their um, passion and a part of what 
motivates them and inspires them to, to want to leave their impact on the world. And so there are a variety of types of services as well. The, this could include advocacy, this could include fundraising or collection efforts, this could include volunteer service, it could be service and educational programs, it could look a lot of different ways. So again, we're asking the applicant to tell us about their mindset towards service, how they've created that in their own lives. Um, and we recognize too that, that students that are in middle school may not have had a ton of opportunity to do this. So we're, we're very interested in their ideas about this, not only just the things that they've already accomplished, but perhaps what they aspire to accomplish, what their vision for service to their community and to others might be. Um, and then finally, the unmet financial need, we will also evaluate through um, a variety of factors. Again, the, the income that I mentioned before, $95,000 per year is sort of our, our metric or our cutoff point, but we're looking at household dynamics, we're looking at um, cost of living, we're looking at parent education level and a variety of factors that help us understand what the need of that particular student really is. What should you expect from the application? So as I've mentioned before, report cards are a part of what you will need to submit. We'll ask for uploaded copies of sixth and seventh grade report cards. We will also ask for test score reports. With test score reports, we want to receive at minimum the state standardized test that the most recent state standardized test that the student has completed. Some students may have taken um, early grade level testing for SAT or ACT. And so if they've had the opportunity to do that, we definitely would like to see those scores as well. And you can plan to submit those. We're asking them to submit recommendations from teachers. They have two recommendations that they will submit. The parent or guardian will also have to complete a form where we ask specific questions that, that only parents could answer about the household, about the income situation. Um, and then students will work on completing the short answer and essay questions that I referenced earlier, um, in addition to reporting their AGI again, which is a part of the parent form actually. Um, so these are sort of the, the key components that you will have to prepare to pull together to submit with your application um, in order for us to fully evaluate and have a complete application for that student. Okay, the next few slides, I'm just going to give you some quick screenshots of the application portal. So if you decide that completing an application is what you want to do, you kind of have a sense of what that looks like before getting started and know that you're on the right track as you move through the application. These are just screenshots of the login page. If you go to our website, www.jkcf.org backslash YSP, you will see an apply now button in blue on that page that you can click that will take you directly to the application portal to create an account and start a new application. And after you've done that and, and chosen your program application, it should be the Young Scholars Program application, the 2020 Young Scholars Program application. You'll create that and you will see it listed um, as in progress on that next screen, that application management screen. The next page will take you to the eligibility quiz where you will be asked those questions, those four questions about eligibility to make sure that you are indeed eligible to complete the application. And once you answer those, you will then be able to move through the rest of the application sections that you see here on the left in blue um, to allow you to complete the application. The student is responsible for the majority of the application for completing the application on their own. We do want students to work on it on their own and complete it on their own. Again, recognizing that middle school students will have support from, from teachers and from parents, um, but they should be the ones driving the application, certainly the ones that are writing their essays, completing the honors and awards, activities and interests sections, um, and telling us their true perspective and thoughts as they're completing the application. In the parent information section, the student will also enter their parent email address and an email will actually be sent to the parent um, to complete the parent form. Um, and so 
this is important to know that the, the student will have a role, but the parent will be the, the primary person completing this form. Um, so just be sure that you're aware that the parents will have a section that they'll be responsible for completing and submitting that is within that student portal. So they might need to, you know, guide the student as they're working through the application to make sure that they do this part correctly. And similarly with the recommenders, the applicant will have the opportunity to um, essentially send an email to their recommenders um, and it will um, notify them that there is a student that has requested for them to submit a recommendation on their behalf. The best advice I can give here for students completing the application is to connect with your recommenders before sending them the email invitation. Have a conversation with them, let them know your plans to submit an application, ask them if they would be willing to submit a recommendation for you, and then go in and enter their information so they can expect to receive the email and be looking for it and complete the recommendation in a timely fashion. Another piece of advice I'd offer regarding recommendations is to, to think about who could submit a quality recommendation for you. Think about a teacher that knows you well. Um, for the personal recommendation, it could be a teacher or it could be a mentor or a coach or someone else in your life who knows you well. I think it's always a good idea to consider someone who knows you in an academic capacity to some extent, even for the personal recommendation. Um, but the main point being that you want your recommenders to have good things to say and to be able to provide some insight into who you are as a person and a student. So be very thoughtful in how you go about choosing who those people are, who those recommenders are for you. And then finally, when it comes to completing your application, you will see at the very bottom on the left hand side, there's a section called review. When you click on that, it will show you which sections of the application may not currently be complete. Those sections will appear in red. And so you technically will not be able to submit the application until all of these are um, completed. But this is sort of a quick snapshot for you to check in and see what's missing, what you still need to complete to allow you to sort of track your progress throughout the application. Um, knowing that you won't really complete this in one sitting, um, you will be able to save um, information as you move through the application by clicking the continue button at the bottom of each page. So for example, if you get to the school history section and you complete that and you click continue to the academics section, everything prior to that will be saved even if you don't have the chance to complete the entire application in that sitting. You can come back to it as long as you hit that continue button at the bottom of the section that you're working on. So this review section can be really critical in allowing you to Make sure you complete in a timely fashion and get everything submitted that you intend to submit. Okay, uh, a couple of important dates to think about. Um, the application opened on January 13th at noon Eastern time. It will remain open for 10 weeks and closes on March 23rd at noon Eastern time. So keep that deadline in mind, March 23rd at noon for yourself as you are scheduling in time in your, in your schedule to complete the application. Um, we, we won't accept materials or we won't accept a late application. There are some instances where we can accept um, certain materials a little bit after the deadline. If you have technical difficulties uploading or submitting things, um, we can accept them a, a couple of days after. But sh shortly after the deadline, we will begin the review process. And once we've started reviewing um, the applicants, we will not be accepting any more materials in order to remain fair in our process of judging each of the um, applicants, reviewing each of the applicants, that they're all working on the same timeline. Um, and so between the end of March, beginning of April and July, we will go through the first phase of review where we will have admissions experts from across the country evaluating every single application that we receive. We do a, a committee-based evaluation process, which means that at least two people will read every application in its entirety um, and make a decision. We'll review and score that applicant. And then we will move to select a group of semifinalists by July. The semifinalist group typically has anywhere from four to 500 students in it. 
and we will notify students that they have become semifinalists. We will notify all applicants of their status in July so everyone can know what's happening moving forward. And then we'll enter the second phase of the review with the semifinalists where they will go through a second round of an application read with the Jack Kent Cook Foundation staff. And we may uh, reach out to the student and family to request additional materials. At this phase of the application process is typically, or the review process, is typically when we ask to verify financial information. So we may be in contact about submitting tax returns or other documents that can help us verify your income to make sure that you are financially eligible to receive the scholarship. Um, and then again, we will review, read the applicants a second time as a staff, and we will also consider interviewing certain applicants um, in order to understand whether or not they would be a good fit working with an advisor and be able to take full advantage of the different um, tools and the different resources that the program provides. And so we'll do that during the, the late summer and come to a decision by the beginning of September who our new Young Scholar recipients will be. We currently plan to select 60 new Young Scholars. Um, sometimes that number may fluctuate a little bit, uh, but it will typically be, be between 60 to 70 students um, that we will notify in September via email that they have become Cook Young Scholars and they'll quickly get connected to their educational advisor and start working with them and planning um, for the coming academic year. Um, okay, so a couple of um, points for additional help as you're working on your application. Uh, we do want to point you to our notification list, our email notification list. If you're interested in receiving application alerts and updates throughout the process, you can sign up at jkcf.org backslash info and we will add you to our email list and be sure and keep you in the loop and up to date as we're progressing through the review process and um, let you know how things are progressing on that front. If you have questions about the application or the program, you can reach us best at scholarships at jkcf.org. Please email us. We are um, responding to email within 48 business hours. Um, so that's the, the timeline we typically work from in getting our responses to your questions out. Um, I would say email is the easiest way to um, get your questions answered. We have a, a, a limited capacity on staff and so we can respond to email a little easier than we can phone calls. However, if you do need to have a conversation or it's easier for you to reach out to us via phone, you can reach us at the toll free number 800-941-3300 and uh, we can answer your questions Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Eastern time um, via phone. So please do reach out to us via phone if you need to, but I would advise starting with the email um, and we will respond to questions as much as we can via email throughout the application process. And finally, if you are a social media user and uh, would like to get a little bit more insight, a little bit uh, more understanding of the Cook Young Scholar experience and the, the Jack Kent Cook Foundation as an organization, please follow us on Twitter and on Instagram at the JKCF is the handle. You can also find us on Facebook, um, Jack Kent Cook Foundation on Facebook, um, but our social media accounts are really cool. We have a lot of scholar stories that we share um, via these avenues updates about what's going on at the foundation and what's going on with the application process for our scholarships. So it's a good way to sort of see what's going on uh, if you're an active social media user and hopefully, you know, can engage with scholars and engage with staff on those platforms and um, gain some information and some knowledge that way as well. Um, so that concludes the webinar. Um, I thank you very much for viewing this. You can return to it and view it at any time throughout the application cycle. You can share it with other students or educators that you know might be interested or might be a good fit for applying for the program. Um, it should be available to you. It will be available on our website um, from now until next year when we uh, create a new webinar 
for next year's application. So take advantage of sharing this and accessing this as often as you need to. Um, and again, if you have questions that were not answered or covered during the webinar, please email us at scholarships at jkcf.org and we will do our best to answer your questions. Thank you so much for viewing this webinar and I wish you the best of luck in your application process as well as all of your educational endeavors.